Good morning, everyone. Um, we are delighted to see you all today. My name is Heather Conley. I'm director and senior fellow of the Europe program at the Center for Strategic and International Studies. Sorry, we started a few minutes late. Uh, we took the opportunity to take to walk from CSIS uh, to, to the hotel. It's a two block walk, but I tell you, it was so beautiful. It was hard not to keep walking and enjoying the beautiful day. So we are uh, delighted uh, uh, that, that you are taking time away from a beautiful outdoor day to be with us this morning. We are extremely fortunate uh, to have Foreign Minister Nikolai Vladimirov with us this morning. The Foreign Minister is on one daunting diplomatic tour. He started uh, with the Prime Minister in Damascus, then to Luxembourg, to Washington, next to New York for the Non-Proliferation Treaty uh, Review Conference, and then, did you tell me, a, a six-day tour of every Balkan capital after he leaves New York. So I hope he's taking his vitamins. That's all I can say. But uh, we are glad that you took time to visit uh, with us here in, in Washington. We asked the minister to give his perspective on uh, the importance of Europe and the transatlantic relationship from uh, a, a unique Bulgarian perspective. And this relationship is doing so much right now, from uh, obviously developing Afghan national security forces via NATO, from uh, uh, providing uh, Haitian earthquake relief via the EU, the nuclear non-proliferation agenda, and so on and so on. This relationship is doing so much and working together, but yet it doesn't feel as if we're connecting on all the levels that we should. So I think it's an, an opportune moment to pause and to reflect and to, to regain the sense of, of transatlantic importance to meeting the challenges of the 21st century. CSIS was extremely fortunate to have the minister visit with us last fall, although he was defense minister at the time, he was not foreign minister. But we are delighted that uh, uh, now with a, a new hat and a new perspective, uh, but yet carrying some of the same uh, opportunities and challenges that, uh, that the minister is with us today. He is known to many of, uh, of you in this room, but uh, prior to his government uh, service, uh, the minister served as a key member of the European Parliament, serving on the Foreign Affairs Committee as well as the Internal Markets Committee. Before he entered politics, he worked uh, in the grassroots and civil society as the uh, program director for the Open Society Institute in Sofia. So he brings many perspectives, and, and uh, we are delighted again to welcome you, Minister, to provide your thoughts. And please join me in welcoming the minister with us this morning. Thank you, thank you, Heather. Indeed, when we, uh, a few months ago, came to Washington, we discussed the opportunity to speak at CSAS. Um, I came in a different hat. Um, I keep saying that I'm happy that my new hat is on Minister of Health, um, <laughs> because we're now embarking on our own health reform in Bulgaria, but that's one I'd like to stay away from, not because I don't feel it's extremely important for our country, uh, but because it's one that I feel there are people far better qualified than me to deal with. Um, I think I've been in D.C. now for 24 hours, and within these 24 hours I've managed to run into, starting from the plane, uh, the foreign minister of Slovakia, my good friend Miroslav Lejcek, and as we landed in D.C. Um, at the airport, I ran into Karl Bildt, the foreign minister of Sweden, by dinner, I was uh, already meeting the, speak the President of the European Parliament, uh, the Lithuanian Defense Minister, and uh, yesterday morning we had the, yesterday afternoon at the um, AGC, a, a beautiful event that, that uh, uh, the American Jewish Committee organized. We had uh, the Spanish Foreign Minister as well as the Dutch Foreign Minister. So you have about a third of EU Foreign Ministers here. Um, and we're all here with carrying the same message. And that message is that it, the transatlantic relationship is the most fundamental cornerstone of how we believe that Europe and America see the world. The transatlantic relationship is the core value that we all uh, carry with us and that we understand is the force for change in the world. 
Of course, there's so many of us that we sometimes get it that it's difficult for you to talk to all of us at the same time um, and figure out what exactly we're trying to say. Uh, but we're also working on that, and we're working with that with great uh, excitement in the European Union after the Lisbon Treaty to try and set up both the new external action service of the European Union, uh, but also become much more coherent in the way that we speak with one voice and carry one message to the rest of the world um, as a union of 27, as a union that holds uh, at the core of its values uh, uh, freedom, democracy, development, prosperity for all. And it is indeed in this context that w my country, Bulgaria, now must look at the world in a different way. Um, it must look at the world in, not as a small country versus big countries, but as a country that belongs to uh, uh, an important community of values, and that is the European Union, as a country that is part of the North Atlantic uh, Alliance, in which both Europe and America have a commonality, not, not just of values, but of interests, um, and how we deal with them. And it is a challenge. I must admit that it is a challenge. Uh, before, or uh, over the last 20 years, uh, we had to accede to Europe and, and, and to the North Atlantic Alliance, and, and that took a, a lot of effort. And it took a lot of uh, effort on the side of the administration, on the side of uh, the political established, but most of all on the side of, of the people of Bulgaria. And sometimes this price was very high. Uh, reforms were delayed and reforms were made difficult. Uh, some, big, some reforms were not priorities. But overall, I think we've been quite successful despite all of our uh, 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 drawbacks in certain cases, but we've been very successful uh, to be where we are today. And today we need to look at how the world around us is changing. And the world is changing definitely very, very fast. The balance of power is shifting. I think about four or five years ago it was very difficult to even conceive that one would read in the papers um, about the U.S.-China relationship the way it is today. Um, it would have been very difficult five or ten years ago to even consider the fact that the European Union can have uh, the commonality that it now seeks in its foreign policy voice in, in, in the work of um, my good friend Cathy Ashton. It, is, it, it, it was completely perhaps impossible to even uh, consider that we would be thinking of how to integrate uh, and how to bring closer to us countries in the Western Balkans, how to engage uh, constructively and with great uh, uh, interest and excitement with countries across, across the Black Sea from where we are, um, and how to find our new role in supporting peace in the Middle East. Uh, of course, they've also, we've, also seen, uh, we've also seen a number of new challenges emerge, and these challenges have by far not been easy, and they're not easy, easy to, uh, to address these days. Iran has moved on a path of uh, radicalism and a path that leaves a lot of questions unanswered as to the uh, use of its uh, nuclear program. We've seen uh, countries emerge, China, Russia, Brazil, and India, emerge with uh, a set of values that is not necessarily exactly the set of values that we might have. We've seen countries emerge powerfully on the international stage that we need to deal with and find, um, and find a new balance with which to be able to achieve uh, our goals of development in Africa, our goals of uh, uh, addressing issues of climate change, our goals of economic prosperity, and our goals of actually peace in, 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 our area, in, 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 the, in the part of the world where, where we live in. And this is a very different world from the world that actually formed me um, and many like me as a generation in politics. Uh, we were formed with a number of, uh, at least three, I think, key events today, and many of us are now stepping onto the stage. The first of this has been the end of communism in 89, and this, this event, this outburst of freedom, and, and this outburst of, uh, of uh, uh, not just freedom, but of, of, of uh, uh, expression that we had in Central and Eastern Europe after the end of communism, and the strong link with America, and a strong uh, transatlantic commitment that stems from that. A few years later, many of us in Southeast Europe had to face uh, a tough environment in which we had the Milosevic dictatorship in Serbia, uh, the wars in Yugoslavia, the devastation that it all caused, and the realization that it is not just the freedom that we 
aspire to, but it is the responsibility to be tolerant ethnically and religiously uh, towards our neighbors, but also within our own communities so that we can, we can live in prosperity and peace. And a few years later, unfortunately, we had September 11th. And that is when many of us realized that actually what we hold so dear, this freedom and this tolerance to our hearts, is not necessarily something that is universally shared. Um, and we actually might need to stand up for it. So there's a whole new generation of people that, have, that are now emerging, of political leaders in Europe that are now emerging, that have been formed by these three different events. And in one way or another, they're all connected to America. And one way or another, they all uh, have implications for how we understand the world and how we understand the transatlantic um, relationship to be. And the core of our understanding is that we, as countries, as members of the European Union, as NATO, as Europe and America, hold one thing very dear to our hearts. And this is the, this is the concept that our sovereignty carries a responsibility with it. We have a responsibility that we bring to the rest of the world and to the, uh, and to the regions for which we're, we have responsibility. And this is, this is the idea that it is not just our values, but it is our interests that are common. I've often been amazed at how, uh, how uh, intellectually challenging discussions can be about Europe and America drifting apart, about how we don't actually anymore have anything in common, we, we've become so different. And that is, a, that is a great, great misconception. Because I believe that the core, of, at the end of the day, the, com the, 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 the community of values that we have is much stronger than the differences that we might have politically from time to time. The commonality of interests that we have in development, in, in democracy, in human rights, in climate change, might actually be much more exciting and much more perspective than the difference that we can have in our discussions. And it is our responsibility, both in Europe and your responsibility in America, to understand that together we're much stronger and together we must work in a much more exciting and responsible way to help solve a lot of the problems that we face today. Bulgaria is a small country. Bulgaria is a country that, uh, uh, that is in a region that has for many, many years, if not hundreds, been characterized as an area of instability. And we've seen, you know, we can all remember all various quotes that politicians 100 years ago used to say about the Balkans. Um, but Bulgaria also has its its responsibility, and it, 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 ha it carries its weight in, in our part of the world. And to us, there are at least three very, very important areas on which we can focus. And we believe that focusing on these areas with our friends in America, with our friends in the rest of the European Union, we can actually be much more successful. First of all, this is the Western Balkans. If the European Union were created to make war impossible in Europe, what more important it is there now to do in the Western Balkans than bring in all of our friends into the European Union so that we can make war impossible in the Western Balkans. Because the war in the Western Balkans was much closer in time um, now than the Second World War. And then the scars are still very visible in society. So we have a historic responsibility to, to, to help our friends reach their goal, their ultimate goal of folding into the family of European nations that has made war impossible. Um, there are a number of, there are a number of uh, key questions that need to be answered in the Western Balkans where we can help. One, firstly, and perhaps most importantly right now is Bosnia. Bosnia is a country that still faces uh, a number of ethnic divisions. It faces many, many challenges to its federal structure. But we need to be forward-looking, and we need to be much more excited about the future that we can build together with Bosnia than uh, we were until recently. And I'm very, very happy that last week, I believe, in the Tallinn meeting of, of the NATO uh, Council, together with Secretary Clinton and other colleagues, we worked intensively to give Bosnia the Membership Action Plan prospect, to invite Bosnia to join the Membership Action Plan for NATO, so that we can have uh, uh, an additional tool to help our friends there um, actually reform and, and come together and, uh, around the commonality of values. And this is in the interest of both America and it is in the interest of Europe and it is in the interest in, of, of countries like Bulgaria. And this is where our responsibility lies, of bringing our allies and partners from across the Atlantic 
on issues where, where if we work together, we can be far more successful than if we work separately. Bosnia is going to be very difficult. I don't think anyone underestimates the challenges uh, that that country faces. But if we can't address these challenges, if we can't finish the business that was started years ago, we might just as well go back home and, and you know, have a drink, watch TV, but, but not actually be involved in politics. This is, our, this is one of our missions. We need to work very closely with Serbia. Uh, Serbia is a country that, has, uh, that is now facing severe economic problems, that is facing uh, a very uh, emotional time because of, its, uh, because of its history with Kosovo, because of its history uh, over the last uh, few, many years now. Uh, with the wars of Yugoslavia. But we must find it in ourselves to reach out to those reformists and those democratic leaders in Serbia that are actually willing to take it on the long and difficult road uh, towards Europe and towards integration um, into our broad community uh, of nations. We must do that, because unless we do that, we will leave a hole right in the middle of the Balkans, and the Balkans shall never be fully part of a Europe united, free, and whole. We need to do that. We need to do that very actively, and we need a, a partnership in that. Uh, we need to work very closely with the rest of our friends in the Western Balkans to resolve all kinds of outstanding issues. We need to help Kosovo. Kosovo is a country that is struggling now uh, to, to develop its institutions, to uh, find its place in, 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 in the world, to develop its economic sustainability. Um, <coughs> And we need to reach out to the authorities in Kosovo and help them in this. And I think this is one, perhaps, on which we've been most active until now. Um, and we have a, a long way to go. Reaching out to Kosovo doesn't mean that we, don't, we should not be speaking to our partners there um, about the challenges that they face and about the need for Kosovo really to become a multi-ethnic society in which Albanians and Serbs and other communities live side by side in peace and, 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 and prosper. And this is a message, this, these are messages that I will be carrying as soon as I go back from New York next week after the NPT review conference and start my long trip uh, around the Balkans. And the, 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 the core message of that trip is that Bulgaria is back in the Balkans. Bulgaria wants to play an active part. Bulgaria wants to find a niche where we can help our friends in the European Union and NATO to resolve uh, issues and resolve problems in a constructive way. Not in trying to fly the banner and, and, and play the game of who is going to be leader of the region. I think that's, that's you know, as one would usually say, that's so, old, that's so 20th century. <laughs> we, need to, to, uh, we need to go beyond that. We need to be practical um, and helpful. We face major challenges, again, in, in the Black Sea area, in the region of the Black Sea, which is one region which I think everyone calls a region, but everyone who say, uses that word realizes immediately that it's very difficult to call it a region when you have such a diversity of countries um, surrounding the Black Sea. We have a lot of, we have business we haven't even begun to tackle in the Black Sea. Uh, we've often talked about the agenda of democracy uh, uh, in, in, in this part of the world, but we have failed completely to look at the agenda of extremely practical issues like environment and, 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 and safety of shipping lanes and, and maritime safety in general and coordinating policies that would make actually the Black Sea a safer place for both uh, travel and for both uh, businesses and, and, and transit. Uh, we have failed even to look at how we work together on the security challenges in the Black Sea. Uh, Bulgaria is now facing a tough time fighting crime and corruption, a tough but I think ultimately a successful uh, endeavor which the government has started a few months ago stemming from the fact that when, when we had the election last year people came out and voted and clearly said to us we can't continue the way that the situation is. We need somebody to clean up the house. We need somebody to put things in order. But we can't put things in order in our own house if we don't work with our partners across the Black Sea and our partners in the Western Balkans on tackling traffic routes on ta tackling human trafficking, on tackling uh, uh, both uh, drugs and all kinds of other challenges that we face. One, when, when one sits in Sofia and we're so much focused on, on Europe and America 
these days that one often tends to forget that it, it, you know, there are a bunch of countries that are far closer to home than actually Brussels is. It takes, it's a three hour flight to get to Brussels, but it's, uh, I think it's a bit, a bit over two hours to fly from Sofia to Damascus. There are a number of countries in between Belgium and Bulgaria, but there's only one country between Bulgaria, Syria, Iraq, and Iran, and that's Turkey. It is inevitable that we look much more closely, again, with our partners in the European Union and NATO, on how can we be helpful in, in, uh, in, 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 in what is going on in, in, in tackling the big challenges in the Middle East, because they affect us dramatically and they affect us uh, uh, pretty much instantly uh, because of our geographic location. Um, this is why the government is now embarking uh, on a policy to reach out to old friends and new partners in the Middle East. Over the last uh, few weeks, the Prime Minister and I have been uh, uh, fortunate enough to reopen our relationship with countries like Kuwait and Qatar, to restart our own relationship with countries like Syria, to begin this trip with a very, very important trip to Israel with which we have a strategic relationship, uh, to, to host in Sofia the Prime Minister of, of, of Lebanon and have intensive and, 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 and very wholesome discussions with our friends in Turkey about how we can be uh, helpful in this process. I'm not saying we're there to resolve Middle East peace. I wish we were, but I think that's something we'll leave to the United States at this point. But uh, what we can do is we can be helpful, and we can be much more focused on a niche where we can, uh, where we can assist. And we can't do this without a transatlantic partnership. We need the transatlantic partnership in order to be able to speak not just in Europe with one voice, but to be able Europe and America to work side by side um, in, 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 uh, uh, in addressing the, the challenges that we face in these three regions. Then there are also thematic areas where we find a lot of, uh, a lot of uh, opportunities for us, a lot of opportunities that again go back to the, a strong transatlantic link between Europe um, and America. Firstly, uh, this is one perhaps specifically faced by, by Bulgaria, but something that everyone in Europe will very easily understand, and this is the issues of energy security and diversification. Of course, America has its own challenges uh, or had its own challenges on, on this front, uh, but we face our own difficulties. Um, I think that, you know, no country should be 100% reliant on its energy supplies on one other country. And it doesn't matter which these two countries are. This is just not healthy. It is not politically healthy. It is not healthy security-wise. It is not economically healthy. And we face um, now uh, the need to diversify um, and, 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 and to develop opportunities through which our country can be much more integrated into the energy networks with our neighbors, with Greece, with Turkey, with Romania, with Serbia, uh, but also to focus on key projects like Nabucco, uh, a project that, that, that to, to, the, to our government, uh, we believe is one of the key uh, projects that can help us reach a diversification of, of, of uh, natural resources for our energy sector. And this project, again, it cannot be developed without a strong transatlantic partnership, without strong links uh, between Europe and America, and without strong leadership. Um, so energy security, and energy diversification, these are issues that we face domestically, but, we're, we're, but are also issues that, that have relation to the new strategic concept of data. I think that if somebody switches off the gas and a few allies within NATO end up in the middle of the winter with no, uh, no heating, that is a security concern. Um, and that is something that in our discussions on the new NATO strategic concept, uh, we also need to pay uh, full attention to. It is, it is about Article 5, and it is about our allied commitment to our territorial security and the security of the alliance. But it is also about Article 4, and it is also about consultation between allies and discussions on where we see the, the, the threats, how they will emerge, and how we will address them. Um, so, it's, so there are all of these new challenges that, that we need to face, and we can't face them uh, we can't face them alone. We're much better facing them together and we'll be much more successful. 
Last but not least, uh, we see uh, uh, now in, next week we have the NPT review conference in New York, um, which is going to start a long, I'm sure, difficult but hopefully successful process of looking um, at the new non-proliferation regime. But we see also very quickly how uh, not just nuclear capability, but delivery systems uh, uh, can spread much more quickly within regions of instability uh, right now. Bulgaria is already within, uh, along with Romania, Greece, and Turkey, within reach of uh, medium-range Iranian rockets. Now, I hope they don't target us, but what's the does that mean that we must not address uh, the issue of creating both a deterrent and a security environment through comprehensive missile defense um, for the territories of NATO that would actually give us not just an advantage, but will give us, um, it, would, would, it, would, it would give us a technological edge to, to protect ourselves should the worst occur, and hopefully it won't. Uh, can we do that alone without America? Or can we do that uh, can, or can any country in Europe do that alone without its partners? No. And this is why now within NATO we are having a very focused discussion on how the, the, the uh, ballistic missile defense should perhaps become one of the missions of the alliance under Article 5. And to my country and to, 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 to the countries in the Balkans, this is a, to NATO allies in the Balkans, this is a very pertinent question. And developing this, uh, this system does not mean excluding um, our friends in, uh, in Russia. It does not mean that we're creating something that will have a hostile stand towards Russia. On the contrary, it gives us a great opportunity to work with Russia on, on developing these, uh, on developing both systems and interacting together politically, militarily, in protecting ourselves against a threat which is both to us, but it is also to them. And this is, and this is I think, where, um, where I would like to end because I was a member of the European Parliament. They used to give us there two minutes more. At the more f most, we would get three minutes of speaking time. And I'm still not out of the habit of, you know, seeing a microphone and talking for too long. But, uh, but perhaps where I want to end is to say that for, for, for Europe and America to be able to play um, uh, the role that we all want uh, our community to play, uh, around the world, but also in its relationship with Russia. We must not just preserve the Atlantic link. We must also find uh, new leadership across the Atlantic that actually pushes it, which actually develops it uh, forward and makes it much more comprehensive. It, makes it, it, it goes beyond security. It goes into people-to-people -people contacts, cultural exchange, educational exchange. It covers the economy uh, uh, to, to an extent which is far greater than any other region uh, in the world. And we must not just preserve it, but we must develop it. And we all have our domestic agendas. Yes, do. You have health care, you have financial services reform, uh, you have, or you don't, I don't know, immigration reform. <laughs> we, have our own we have our own domestic agenda. We have to deal with our own health care reform. We have our pension reform. We have our energy issues to deal with. In Europe, we have all our internal issues to deal with, figuring out how the new external action service will work, uh, figuring out how the Lisbon Treaty works. Uh, and we can very easily get entangled into our domestic agendas and forget that actually there's more. And that more is what brings us together. And this is the transatlantic uh, relationship. And this is what we need to strengthen. And this demands political leadership, and it demands vision for the future. I don't want to live in a world in which the global agenda is set by events that we're, as we were discussing earlier this morning, we're trying to catch up to. I want to live in a world where we actually see events or are able to predict them in advance and, and, and design our strategies and design our um, actions so that, we can, uh, so that we can lessen the threats and increase the opportunities uh, for development. And to this, we have the greatest thing that has preserved the unity across the two sides of the Atlantic for 50 years, for more than 50 years now, which is, uh, which is the relationship between America and Europe and Europe and America. And this has been strengthened by the enlargement of the European Union, by the enlargement 
uh, of NATO. It has brought a new perspective and, and it has brought a new sensitivity to the problems that, that, and the challenges that we all face. So what I say is let's take our jackets off, put our thinking hats on, and actually see how together we can work much more effectively uh, in addressing the challenges of the 21st century, whether they be in the Balkans or, or across the Pacific. Thank you. Mr. Minister, thank you very, very much. That was a, a, a strong presentation, I think, articulating the areas uh, where we can work together. Uh, but I like the end where you're demanding a vision and demanding leadership. Uh, because I think uh, looking back over the last 65 years of transatlantic relations, uh, the focus regionally has been Europe, whether during the Cold War, post-1989 through the 90s with the Balkans, we were naturally focused transatlantically uh, on Europe. But since 2001, we're focusing on Afghanistan, Iraq, Iran, Pakistan, North Korea. These do not lend themselves to the geog geographical focus that we once had. So this requires us to work uh, much harder. Well, I have a great pleasure of being a moderator with only two tasks before me is to keep this mo uh, meeting on time. And since we started a little late, I think we have a, about a half an hour for questions and comments and, and good dialogue. And the other task I have uh, is uh, the moderator gets the prerogative of throwing out the first pitch. I like to use baseball analogies. And then you all can provide the minister with your curve balls, your fast balls, your soft balls, whatever you prefer, uh, and to keep the, uh, keep the dialogue going. So my, my first question actually has uh, two parts, if you'll indulge me. Um, Today's New York Times headline reads, as Greek drama plays out, where is Europe? Financial Times in an op-ed uh, headline says, Europe is unraveling. Although you aren't directly affected uh, by the Greek financial crisis because Bulgaria is not in the Eurozone, your, your interest rates are going up because of it. We see Europe struggling with the post-Lisbon Treaty institutions, whether it's creating the External Action Service or, or other institutions. But we also see, I think, I see a leadership crisis in, uh, in the EU's enlargement strategy in Turkey. You mentioned that as uh, uh, part of the Middle East strategy and looking at a forward-thinking enlargement strategy for the Balkans. Is there a political leadership crisis in Europe right now? That, to, that can overcome these challenges? And how, from a Washington perspective, how can we understand this dynamic? So that's sort of part one. Totally different direction. Uh, we saw lots of de developments this week in the Ukrainian parliament with the approval of the extension of the uh, uh, lease of the Black Sea Fleet, the Russian Black Sea Fleet in Sevastopol to 2042. We see perhaps a growing militarization of the Black Sea. And I'd love your comments and thoughts from a Bulgarian perspective on, uh, as the Balk Black Sea is certainly an area of focus, uh, what are you seeing and what keeps you awake at night about the Black Sea? Thank you. Two and easy questions, by the yeah. way. If I can hit a home run on both oh, of these, run. this will be, um, you know. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> yeah. Um, is there a leadership crisis in Europe? Uh, if, if we look at what's happening with Greece, I think there's a, I mean, there's definitely a financial crisis in Greece, but what, uh, what many in Europe want to see, and happily Prime Minister Papandreou has provided it, is a very, very firm commitment to the reforms that Greece will undertake uh, this year and next year, uh, obviously at great e economic and political cost, but reforms that are very much needed. Uh, because it is the, the, the credibility of the euro is at stake here, and this goes beyond the countries that are in the eurozone. It affects us far more, actually, perhaps than many others, because it delays our plans to go join um, the euro. It uh, creates uncertainty as to the investment, um, uh, Greek investments in Bulgaria, and it creates many, many, many dif dif difficulties in that. Perhaps there's, there's not a leadership crisis, but perhaps there's a, uh, there's, a, uh, there's a difference of opinion of how we handle this. Um, and I think very, very slowly, but we've come to the point at which the consensus is that the lead should be taken by the Greek government. 
and, and the lead on these reforms must be based in Greece. Europe must be ready to support, along with the IMF, Greece as Greece needs it, but only on Greece's request uh, and, and uh, uh, based on the plan that's plans that Greece develops. Uh, all of these titles, which you call Greek drama, where is Europe? Euros, Europe is unraveling. Europe is not unraveling. Uh, Europe is sticking to the rules that it has put in place. <coughs> Um, and sticking to these rules is, is very important because if you undermine the rules, then the effect will become even greater, uh, greatly more negative in other countries. Bulgaria has had to constrain uh, at great political cost its, its, its budget deficit for last year. Uh, we've managed to finish last year within a 3% deficit. We are constraining the deficit for this year as much as we can. We're, we're planning also to not go be, beyond a 4% deficit uh, for, 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 for this year. Um, when I was Minister of Defense, my budget got cut by 30%. Um, and that, that comes at a very high uh, social cost uh, as well. But, but sticking to these rules is, is very important. And, and we understand clearly that we can borrow our way out of this crisis. Uh, we need to weather the storm, and we need to make sure that we streamline our processes, streamline um, our institutions, and make sure that we are in, prepared in a, uh, uh, for the time when the crisis will be on its way out. So there's no leadership uh, crisis in Europe. There are different opinions, but I think they've all now converged uh, around the fact that we need to, we need to help, uh, help Greece. Uh, Ukraine and um, the lease of the Black Sea Fleet, Wow, those pictures from the Ukrainian parliament were dramatic. Um, and it is a dramatic issue. It is clearly an issue that is divisive within Ukrainian society. Um, but I think that overall, if we look at, at, at the Black Sea in the longer uh, run, we need to be very careful how uh, we address uh, questions of military balance in the Black Sea. Um, and we need to be careful because it is, it is very fragile. It is fragile because of the fact that simply you have at least three extremely large countries. You have Russia, the Ukraine, and Turkey bordering the Black Sea. You have two member states of the European Union, th three member states of the North Atlantic Alliance. Uh, you have Georgia on the other side. Um, and, and, and this creates a very, very delicate situation. So um, in our assessment, what, what uh, the, the decision to ratify the, uh, the agreement um, on the Black Sea, uh, in the long run, might actually uh, prove to have been inevitable uh, for the Ukraine at this point. It doesn't mean that we need to uh, that we need to uh, that we need to uh, not be careful enough about how we handle issues of security, uh, but we need to be extra extra cautious uh, in how we deal with all of the countries around the Black Sea. And this is why I said in the beginning that perhaps you know we focus too much um, uh, on on some areas and 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 not focused enough on other areas. Uh, there are plenty of things that we can do in maritime safety um, and, and 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 trafficking in the Black Sea that we need to address. Uh, and perhaps by building the trust of nations around the the shores of the Black Sea through issues like that, through tackling issues like that, we will be in a far better position to increase also the uh, stability of our security agenda. Um, in the medium run. But we need to start somewhere, and it's better to start somewhere where uh, we can all agree on. Thank you so much. Please, let's uh, take some good questions. Margarita, please. Margarita, son of Institute for New Democracies. Um, Mr. Minister, you launched an important initiative uh, with Macedonia for furthering Bulgaria's relations with Macedonia you're going to Skopje after this trip. Do you see a good prospect of uh, signing the agreement? And the other thing is um, the Greek crisis, as bad as it is, do you think it provides a um, good opportunity for agreement on Macedonia's name by the Greek side? Now that probably nobody is going to pay too much attention internally in Greece. Thank you. Thank you. Yes, indeed. I'm, um, I've, when, when, when I finish this trip, I fly straight to Skopje for uh, our bilateral discussions with Macedonia. And one of the issues which is uh, large on our table is a 
uh, treaty which we have proposed to Macedonia, um, uh, a treaty of friendship and, and good neighborly relations. Um, is there a good prospect for signing that? There is if we, if we can, both sides can actually for about a week at least stop reading the press um, <laughs> and actually focus on the real issues that we need to deal with. Uh, I say this uh, actually quite um, with, with grave disappointment because uh, uh, I fear that our agenda, both Bulgaria and Macedonia's relationship has been, uh, has been overcome and has been overtaken uh, by, um, issue, by, by an agenda that has not been set by the politicians but has been set by the media. Um, and this, this is not good. Uh, what we need to do is recapture that initiative, and I, I hope to be able to do that with uh, my friend Antonio Milosevsky in uh, Skopje, um, and actually move forward on, on, on creating a framework for our bilateral relations that really reflects what people think. Bulgaria has, over the last 20 years, been most helpful uh, and, and, and a good friend of Macedonia. We were the first country to recognize its independence. We, were the, uh, we helped it during the, uh, uh, the uh, sanctions on Yugoslavia to get oil and food into Macedonia. We helped during the Kosovo crisis. Uh, we've done nothing bad with which our friends in Macedonia could, could complain about. Yet, yet, yet there's all of this, this, this emotional cloud which has developed which we need to get through right now. And I hope to be able to do that because we're two countries that live side by side. Macedonia aspires to be a member of the European Union and NATO, and we have a responsibility to help it join the European Union and NATO and to help it be a stable, uh, a stable democracy uh, that, that contributes to the security of our entire region. Um, I wouldn't create a direct link between the Greek crisis and the uh, issue, the name issue, which is the, the bilateral issue between Macedonia and Greece. Um, I wouldn't do that because I don't think it's an issue of uh, people not paying attention to it or being diverted to do something else and then we can squeeze something through uh, for an agreement. It is a, it is a very, very complex, complex question uh, that is v both very profoundly important to Greeks and to Macedonians alike. Um, what we have often said, and we've said this to uh, our friends in Skopje and our friends in Athens, uh, is that we're convinced that there must be a compromise. There must be a compromise reached which is acceptable to both sides because otherwise uh, the, the opportunities that Macedonia uh, has in front of it uh, with NATO, with the European Union, uh, will be made far more difficult uh, than if there is no compromise. Uh, and honestly, I hate to have to continue to use this uh, acronym uh, and to keep reading it because it is embarrassing uh, the 20 years after the end uh, uh, of communism and, and years after the end of the, the, the disentanglement of Yugoslavia, uh, we still have one country that uses former, that we, you know, that has a former um, in, in an acronym uh, that many of us uh, have to use. So, so we hope that there will be agreement. Um, I, uh, we've seen good signs. We've seen a positive, positive signs both from Skopje and Athens uh, we need to be very careful now uh, not to upset the balance, but both sides also must be very careful. Macedonia now has a, a, a key position as uh, chair of the, count, the Council of Ministers of the Council of Europe, um, and, and I hope it uses that position to actually advance the opportunities of foreign negotiations with, Macedon with Greece um, rather than to, uh, to upset them. Thank you. So you had a question, then you. My name is George Hanley. I have a question uh, for you regarding your uh, vision for Balkan cohesiveness. Mm -hmm. uh, as you travel to the different countries, will there be some near-term initiatives or areas that you will stress with uh, these countries as priorities to demonstrate the value and the potential for uh, Balkan cohesiveness? And do you see the Southeast Europe Regional Cooperation Council as being an ally in moving this vision forward? Um, yes, we have a number of um, ideas which we will take to our friends in the Western Balkans. Um, I think I've, uh, I think my own ministry at this point hates me for doing this because I'm, you know, 
we're, I've asked them to set up such an agenda that, uh, that, 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 that they stay up late at night, but, uh, uh, but it, it is needed. And I think what we will do is, you know, what one we need to focus on is uh, obviously Macedonia and our bilateral relationship with Macedonia. Uh, very much focused on the uh, uh, membership action plan decision for Bosnia um, and particularly before the elections make sure that our friends in Bosnia understand the implications of what uh, we, 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 the decision we took in Tallinn. Uh, hopefully bringing, bringing them more in line with various initiatives that, that, that exist in the region. Uh, uh, focusing uh, in, in, in Kosovo, I'd like to have a very honest discussion with uh, with our friends there and how we can uh, not just be helpful to, to building Kosovo institutions, uh, but also in, in helping Kosovo really live up to the standard of, uh, of a multi-ethnic um, uh, society. Um, so we have, we, have a lot of, we have a lot of ideas at this point that, uh, that we want to put on the table. Um, and, and I hope the reaction to that will be positive. Uh, I, I plan, you know, once we, we do this whole trip, uh, to uh, to also talk to my friends and my colleagues in the European Union um, and see what we can actually deliver from all of these uh, opportunities that now uh, exist in the Western Balkans and what are the real challenges and what are the real difficult questions that we need to uh, to address. Um, uh, the Southeast European Regional Cooperation Council is obviously a very useful initiative. Uh, what, what I'd like to, to see is it actually engage more actively in practical uh, projects on the ground, projects that actually uh, bring uh, people not just to, 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 to conferences, but actually bring them to work together on specific, uh, uh, specific networks of expertise that they can develop, whether that is in customs or in uh, you know, uh, border security or whether that's on uh, sort of more softer issues as well. But it is a useful, it is a useful initiative. It would not, however, be able to, uh, um, to politically push the reform agenda as the European Union accession process could. Uh, and this is the most important tool that we have, the stabilization and association agreements with the Western Balkans and the prospects that, uh, as they meet the criteria, these countries can uh, can become parts uh, parts of the European Union. Uh, I realize very much that you know now is a very difficult time to talk about these issues in Europe. Um, it's a tough time to uh, to uh, to go back to the enlargement agenda the way it was a few years ago. Uh, but we miss but we miss must keep. A steady pace, uh, and as we, you know, as as opportunities emerge, seize them if we really believe that this is important. Um, and this is this is what I hope that not just Bulgaria but other countries in the Balkans will see. And I know that the Greek government and the Slovene um, government and the Austrians and and and, and others are very interested in, uh, in 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 seeing how we can keep the agenda alive, uh, so that when the opportunities arise, we can actually seize them. Thank you. Good to see you again, Meto Koloski, United Macedonian Diaspora. Uh, you mentioned uh, transatlantic principles and all, um, you know, and, and adhering to all these principles uh, as Bulgaria and American uh, Europe. Just a clarification point and then a question. Um, unfortunately, a compromise which our organization does not agree with. Uh, Greece insists on Macedonia changing its name and its passports and its constitution and its language and identity and whatnot and claims that Macedonia has territorial aspirations. But Macedonia, I think that Bulgaria's position is Macedonia is Republic of Macedonia. The name is Republic of Macedonia and that will continue to be the name of the country in bilateral reference. Um, so the use of an acronym or the former Yugoslav Republic of Macedonia is inconsistent with Bulgaria's position, I guess. Uh, but my main question is really about the Council of Europe and the State Department's human rights reports uh, that state that Bulgaria does not recognize a Macedonian minority within its borders. So it's questioning uh, what is your position on that and do you envision the minority uh, being recognized anytime soon? Thank you. Thank you. Um, I don't remember using an acronym to refer to Macedonia. Um, 
I think the, the issues of uh, what and how compromises with Greece can be reached is an issue that is between Skopje and Athens. Uh, we don't have a, we, you know, we've recognized Macedonia as the Republic of Macedonia. Um, and as such, uh, we don't have a problem calling it Macedonia. Um, um, and, and I'm not going to ever call it an acronym. Um, so uh, I, what, I would, what I would say is that I think, what, but what I think is very important for everyone to understand in this dispute is that um, I hear often people in, um, in Skopje say, well, uh, we can't compromise because this is our sovereign right. Uh, and, th and they're right. You know, it's the sovereign right of every country to, to name it, to, to call itself uh, uh, what it wants because that's part of the, the symbols of sovereignty. Um, but it is also the sovereign right of every country to understand that uh, it can also and it must find compromises when the stakes in the future of this country are involved. Um, and this is why we urged both Greece and Macedonia to work very, very hard um, and to work very constructively um, in developing such a formula which would be acceptable to both sides but would allow Macedonia to progress further in its uh, negotiations with the European Union and NATO. Uh, and I think this is what, what is most important. Uh, the opportunities that exist before the people of Macedonia to develop economically, to develop politically, to develop, to develop in terms of civil society, et cetera, et cetera, to be part of this, um, this community. And these are very, very hard choices, and these are decisions that, 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 that carry great weight uh, and great consequ consequence with them. But I hope that the leadership, both in Skopje and Athens, has the full uh, and uh, you know understands the full um, extent of these uh, uh, of these actions, and will uh, and will soon reach a, a decision which would be acceptable. Um, as far as uh, uh, minorities in Bulgaria, let me be absolutely straight about this: we do not have we do not recognize minorities in Bulgaria because our legal system is based on the fact that people have individual human rights. And as individual human rights, they develop, uh, they, they have the right to uh, express themselves uh, or, to, uh, to, or to study or to learn languages or to do whatever it is that they want to, to express their individual um, identity. Our legal system does not uh, uh, provide for uh, minority groups. We have a large Turkish population in Bulgaria, which is fully integrated into society because they are Bulgarian citizens. They're citizens of, of the country of Bulgaria, but, they're, but, we do not, uh, but, but our legal system does not give them special rights because they're a minority, because as human beings they have rights. It's not a, an issue of belonging to a, uh, to a community, but it is an issue of being a human being with rights. So this is why uh, this, uh, uh, this, th th this is our, 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 our legal system. Um, and I think the issue uh, that, that is uh, often raised about, uh, you know, Macedonian minorities in Bulgaria, uh, I'm sorry I'll be very frank about this. I think that every time this issue comes up, I fear that there's somebody who wants to disturb our relationship with it. Because, because, the, because we have far more to talk about the opportunities be that exist between our countries. And, and the prospects for developing our countries uh, than to, uh, to focus on these issues. Uh, so to me, that's a non-issue. Uh, we have a legal system. We have a legal process which has uh, spoken clearly on, uh, uh, on this within the f limits and within the framework of our constitution. But I'm not going to go to Skopje next week and get entangled into a discussion of whether there's a uh, uh, a this minority or a that minority across the border. If we're going to do that, that means that we don't really understand what, you know, what, what Europe is about and what, uh, what, what, what coming together around the commonality of values means. I'm not going to get entangled into a discussion of whether Gotze Delchev is a Macedonian or a Bulgarian hero, because I don't remember when is the last time that I heard a French and a German argue whether Charlemagne was a French or a German king. You know, this is part of our common history. This is part of what we are. We are, uh, and, and, and we carry this with us. And, and we'd be far better advised to look forward than to continuously look backwards. Uh, it's not a zero-sum game. It's not about one side winning and another side losing. 
It's about a win-win situation in which we will all be feel more secure. We will all have more opportunity uh, if 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 we work uh, uh, if we work together. And and I think overall in the Balkans we've seen far too many politicians, and this has created far too many problems. Uh, seeing the relationship with a neighboring country, whichever that country that is, as a zero-sum game, and it's not. You know, this is what this is what the 90s were about. I mean, let let us all grow up. We'll have you the last question. Thank you. Okay. Um, Catherine Messina-Payage from NDI. Nice to see you again, Mr. Minister. Um, since we're on the topic of minorities, um, I'd like to raise the subject of the Roma community yep. in Europe. And that's an, uh, a community in which um, Bulgaria has a very strong record of inclusion, consistent representation in parliament and government among the first countries in Europe to develop a strategy <clears throat> for greater inclusion and um, trying to uh, desegregate uh, the schools and so on. And so I guess I'm, I'd like to just ask what kind of a leadership role Bulgaria can take uh, because the Roma community does face such disproportionate poverty across Europe and we're seeing rising trends in uh, the far right and anti-Roma sentiment uh, throughout Europe. And the recent elections in Hungary were one example hmm. where it was rather unsettling the kind of rhetoric around the campaigns and what's been happening in Roma communities. So what can Bulgaria do on that front as a, a leader in the region? Um, I mean, Catherine, you know Bulgaria well. So you know that it is a very um, uh, ethnically and religiously tolerant society. It is a society which has, for hundreds of years, had Christians and Jews and Muslims living side by side, uh, including during the Second World War, where uh, uh, it was actually civil society that helped um, save our Jewish uh, population. So we have a strong tradition in that. Uh, however, I don't think we should uh, side away from the fact that we also have uh, a community in our country that we, we have a lot of discriminatory practices towards, and this is the Roma community. Uh, uh, it may not be as bad as it is in other parts of Central and Eastern Europe, but it is still there. Um, and the fact that we've seen uh, uh, Roma members of parliament and, and rise up within the administration, I don't think that is, resolves the question of, of large-scale poverty, lack of educational opportunity, and, and, and social exclusion uh, uh, of, 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 if not all, large parts of the Roma community in Bulgaria. Um, so um, what I think we need to do is instead of looking uh, towards taking a leadership role uh, in, in driving a debate across Europe on this. We should actually uh, focus a little bit more about uh, at home um, and, and, and continue some of the excellent work which has been done in the past um, and also find other ways of, um, uh, of providing more opportunity to our uh, Roma communities. Uh, and then maybe uh, serve, uh, serve as an example. Uh, because the, 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 the problems that Roma uh, communities are, across Europe face are very, very similar, actually. I mean, they're, they're all, uh, and, and they're cross-sectoral, they're not isolated. It's, it's not an issue of saying social, just social policy or just educational policy. Um, these are cross-cutting cross issues across various sectors of society and across countries. Um, um, it is a worrying trend, what we're seeing with this rising uh, uh, sentiment uh, uh, that, uh, you know, if you look at it historically, always accompanies some sort of a financial or economic crisis. Uh, so we must, uh, we must find at a, at a European level a way of, of addressing this. And I think the, the anti-discrimination center in Vienna, I don't remember its full name and also has a nice acronym to it, um, um, is, uh, uh, is, is a key tool for this. Uh, the European Commission, uh, when I was in the European Parliament, I, together with some other colleagues, we wrote a letter to the Slovenian at that point presidency asking for a, uh, a commissioner that would have a a, a, as part of their portfolio a responsibility for Roma, Roma problems around Europe. But as far as Bulgaria is concerned, I think we should look a little bit more carefully at what we do at home uh, before trying to, to, to lead the debate on this. 
Well, uh, let me begin by saying, Mr. Minister, I think you hit a home run, if we're going to keep that baseball analogy going. You did. Knocked it out of the park. Thank you so much. Excellent questions from our audience. Thank you for being with us uh, this morning. And on behalf of CSIS, Mr. Minister, thank you for sharing your insights with us. It was a very you, stimulating Heather. discussion. And have a wonderful day and a fantastic weekend. The weather is going to be great, so enjoy it. Thank you very much. Thank you very much.